For Sunrise, William Fox authorized Murnau freedom from studio constraints that became legendary. Sunrise earned Fox three Academy Awards. Best Actress, Janet Gaynor. Cinematography, Charles Rosher and Carl Struess. And Unique and Artistic Picture, Fox Films. Rokas Gliza won honorable mention for art direction. Sunrise went on to become a classic of world cinema. In January 1928, when Morneau began shooting his next film, Four Devils, set in the circus, he stated with confidence, Everything is subordinated to my picture, and just as I do not permit myself to be influenced away from what I think is the right thing to do and the right person to use, I will not do a picture that is based on a theme not to my liking or conviction. Only one year later, Murnau's situation had reversed. Changing a film's title before it was released was normal in Hollywood. But changing Our Daily Bread, Murnau's follow-up to Four Devils, to City Girl, coincided with his early departure from Fox in February 1929. City Girl was finished while Murnau was in Tahiti, working with Robert Flaherty on Taboo, one of the last great films of the silent cinema. Murnau never made another movie. He died after a car crash in California the week before Taboo premiered in New York on March 18, 1931. He was only 42 years old. From Murnau's American period, only four devils remains unknown to us. All prints seem to have vanished long ago, an accident of fate that we hope may be rectified by an accident of rediscovery. Although we are not able to see the film itself, we have access to rich materials documenting its production and reception. These traces help bring us closer to the world of the film and to Murnau's experience. This essay does not pretend to be a reconstruction of anything except traces. Some of the most powerful bear testimony as accidental witnesses, like ghosts, phantom images worthy of the creator of Nosferatu. This is the program from the premiere of the silent version of Four Devils, held in New York City at the Gaiety Theater on October 3, 1928. Fox would release a part talking version in June 1929. The credits include Murnau as director, Bertolt Fiertel as writer, and Janet Gaynor as Marion, the only star in the movie. Mary Duncan plays the vamp, Charles Morton has the other lead role as Charles. Blueprints survive from the introductory section of the film when the main characters are children. They detail the circus wagon that Chucky, the clown, and the children live in. The walls and the roof are removable so that the cameras can shoot from all angles within the small space. The clown takes care of the two girls as if they were his own children. In the living room, sitting at the window, is a man, a clown, who abruptly turns his head and looks out. Two small girls on the knees of the clown, startled, raise their heads to look out of the window. He sees how Chucky is beating the poodle with the whip. Publicity stills document many scenes in the film. We see the actors, how they are dressed, something of the dramatic purpose of the scene but still photos were almost never taken from the same position as the moving picture camera. And the images are evenly lit, showing much more than the filmed images would. The best indications of visual effects and the camera's viewpoint, although not movement, come from drawings prepared by Murnau's art director, Robert Harrelf. The atmosphere of light and shadow, the confined space the girls are in, and the man's boots that dominate the frame convey a sense of menace that is absent from the publicity photo. A woman approaches with two boys. Where can I find the director of the circus? She brings the boys inside Chucky's circus car. I 
I understand that you instruct children. The famous aerial acrobats, Rossi, were their parents. They were killed in the leap to death. Will you be their teacher? Adolf has taken off his shirt to be examined by Checky, but his older brother Charles refuses. If he wants to be an artist, he better learn to obey. Charles is forced to submit. These quotations from the final script and intertitles show the characters' original names. In the film, Fritz's name was changed to the more American-sounding Charles. Amy became Marion. There between old boxes, trash, and circus paraphernalia, Fritz is hiding like a wounded animal. He lies huddled on his face, one arm pressed lengthwise along his body, palm upturned, the other arm crushed under his head, his frame convulsed with heavy sobs. The children are going to be well trained? Was that your mother? Marion tries to comfort Charles by giving him the watch that her mother had given her. These are photographs of the interior of the circus wagon taken by the art department and meant to be used for reference purposes. From childhood, the life of an acrobat is full of labor and risks, an everlasting rehearsing and rehearsing. Close up, while Fritz desperately stands on the flat saddle. Looking around, Fritz sees while he's riding. Everything is swaying and passing through each other, and in the midst of it all, Checky's wicked face. Looking at Checky over his back, we see how he gets ready to crack the whip a second time and hit the horse. The struck horse goes into a quick, short gallop. Fritz, not expecting this, slips off and lands in the air. With a brutal jerk, Checky drops him into the sawdust ring, where the boy remains, lying half stunned. The horse comes and carefully steps over Fritz, who is lying in the ring. Checky raises Fritz up again by pulling on the rope, crying. Close up, the face of the frightened child distorted. I can't. One night, Chucky comes in drunk and loud. He wakes up the clown, and he wants to wake up the children. He threatens the children and starts to fight with the clown. The clown fights him in order to protect the children. The clown leads the children away in a wagon. In this manner, the man who has learned to love the children took them into the world. He became their teacher, their father. They go through the countryside to other circuses. The clown performs. The children grow up. They worked to the best of their ability year after year. Often, they were hungry together. The clown is becoming old and too weak to perform any longer. Yet he tries to carry on for the sake of the children. The clown collapses from weakness after a performance. Marion, he should not work anymore. Charles, soon now, we will be able to lift the burden. Only at night, when the rest of the artists sleep or were on pleasure bent. Mysterious doing took place in the circus. Night after night, the clown would watch and coach the enthusiastic practice of the one grand number. Evening, a large city covered with snow, through which come dazzling, moving, crossing, whirling, electric light signs, which we see on shadowy facades and roofs, half-finished words, 
names of hotels, places of amusements, through which appears the motif. The four, great sensation, leap of death, circus dome. We are now at the circus in Paris. Murnau begins behind the scenes, showing animals and performers coming and going. The circus arena is visible in the background through an opening in the tent. The four devils are grown up now. They are about to perform as the main event, the top aerial attraction. The circus director announces, Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to introduce to you tonight the world-famous acrobats known as the four devils. According to an enthusiastic review in Variety, Murnau has given the four devils a ring entrance that will set every acrobat in the world on fire when seeing it. In flowing devilish wraps, they ride into the ring on white horses with the clowns preceding them. Their trapezes are lowered. As each of the quartet rides under them, they are taken aloft, their wraps falling off on the way up to aerial pedestals. In Films of the Future, an essay Mornell wrote while he was preparing for Devils. He said, the camera, quote, must gallop after the equestrian. It must pick out the painted tears of the clown and jump from him to a high box to show the face of the rich lady thinking about the clown. So I have had them build me a sort of traveling crane with a platform swung at one end for the camera. This must be how Mornau could give the impression during the spectacular first entrance of the four devils into the circus ring that we are seeing through the eyes of a galloping horse as if it had a camera attached to it. The script reads, camera fixed on the horse's head. There is a program on her lap, open at the page which announces the act of the four devils, giving their pictures. The jeweled fingers of the lady begin, unconsciously, to fold the program, as one would to make a paper fan, while her eyes are lifted dreamily to the cupola, now quite dark, where one can dimly discern the shadowy shapes of the four trapezes. The lady leaves with her escorts to have dinner at a fine restaurant. The final script was written by Karl Meyer, Bertolt Viertel, and Marion Orth, although only Viertel received screen credit. We have every reason to believe that Murnau was involved with developing the script along with Viertel, and at a later stage, Orth, who must have helped Americanize it. The first treatment in the Fox story file was written by Murnau, it already contains, in miniature, the visual logic of the film, which is based on strongly marked shifts in point of view and optical effects, such as montage sequences and superimpositions, combined with the realistic details of the circus. The acrobats have finished their evening meal in their modest restaurant. They climb the stairs to their rooms. The next morning, the girls wake up happy. The rose that Charles gave Marion is in the glass beside her bed. Then we see the boys wake up. And then we see the lady. The lady servants are packing her things for a trip. She tells them to stop. I'm not going to the Riviera. At the next performance, the lady is in the circus box again. The lady, with a slight shudder, moves the glasses and sees the attendants bring the net and begin to spread it. The camera, still used as opera glasses, moves from that picture up into the cupola, and we see every detail in rapid flashes. Perhaps Adolf and Louise, sitting in a trapeze very high up, look at Amy, 
who is standing on a springboard, holding a trapeze, ready to throw it to her partner. Fritz, swinging on a trapeze, lets go with a terrific swing, and flying into space, throws a three-time somersault. Amy throws the trapeze toward him. We see her, how under an appealing mental strain she stands, ready to act. We see that last second decision, and then, with deadly accuracy, she throws the trapeze, on which Fritz lands. The circus family are at the place they always eat. They've prepared a surprise for Charles, a birthday cake, and a celebration. Adolf enters Charles' room. Charles's bed is empty. These drawings show the car that is taking Charles and the lady to the lady's villa. We see him inside her drawing room, waiting for her. And then we have a photograph from the art department that shows the same setting, but with no actors. In this one, we can see a slate with the cinematographer's name on it, Ernest Palmer. The lady enters. We feel, rather than see the door open, and suddenly she appears in the circle of light in front of the fireplace like an apparition. There is a smile on her face, a bewitching smile, which is directed into the gloom where she sees Fritz as a dark figure. And so it is Fritz who steps in the circle of light, smiling at the lady. The lady bends down to the logs which are lying beside the fireplace, picking one up with her beautiful hands. She throws it on the fire, and the fire flares up, illuminating with a flickering light the face of the woman bending toward it, while Fritz, with a dreamlike gravity, watches. Charles finally returns home in a taxi. At the next performance, and the next, the lady throws a rose to the feet of her lover. A small area in the sawdust, exactly the same angle as in the two previous shots, except that perhaps the feet of Fritz do not appear in the shot, as a large rose falls into it. Instantly, the rose dissolves into a note written on heavy, uncrusted paper, which reads, Beloved, immediately after rehearsal as another rose, dropping in a different position, falls into the sawdust and instantly dissolves into another note on the same paper and in the same handwriting, which reads, Dearest, I'll be waiting after the performance. Hurry, hurry. Fade as another rose, falling in still another position, dissolves instantly into a third note. This note paper bears a conspicuous crest and letterhead, which reads Hotel Crillon. Precious, you will see by the letterhead that I have found a new place to meet. The next night, Charles waits until he thinks his brother is asleep. He begins to get dressed. His brother tries to stop him from leaving. It is impossible for you to continue your work and keep on like this. Even now, you are not steady, and you will ruin the rest of us as well. Charles makes another night visit to the lady. We see the lady on the telephone, in her bathtub. The call is from Charles. At the rehearsal, Charles is distracted, unsteady. Fritz, hanging on the trapeze with outstretched arms, swings, swings, breathing heavily, dripping with perspiration, swings out of the picture, toward us again, makes a somersault, which twirls darkly in front of the camera. For the first time, he falls in a rehearsal, performing his triple somersault. This is a photograph from the art department, showing a tavern where Charles writes to the lady, close up of a partly written letter. I'm in such a mood that I am not good company for anyone, so please do not expect me this afternoon. But more than ever, I am yours. He drinks. Close up. Spilled sugar. 
as Fritz's finger, making aimless patterns with the grains, gradually and unconsciously forms the letters NET. Marion is looking out the window, imagining a time when she and Charles might be lovers. Marion has been waiting for Charles to come back from the lady. When he does, he passes her on the stairs. The four devils perform again. And Adolf in Charles's dressing room, there's a bouquet of flowers from the lady. For the first time, Charles speaks harshly to the clown. I am not an acrobat. I am a man with feelings. My life means more to me than my profession. Charles is not himself anymore. He fights with the clown, and he fights with his brother. He wants them to leave him alone. Marion has tried to hide her heartbreak from him. Charles goes to the lady again. Marion is desperate. She follows Charles to the lady's villa, and she manages to get inside. She waits for the lady. Then she leaves, and she waits outside in the cold almost all night. When Charles finally comes out, he finds her. He takes her up in his arms. He decides to break with the lady and go back with the circus family. She decides to see him in the circus anyway. She convinces him to come to see her right after the rehearsal. That night, he will perform the triple somersault without a net. A large oval mirror, which is shattered as the bottle hits it. Then suddenly, the frightened face of the boy appears reflected back of the cracked glass. As he stares at it, double expose. Over the cracked lines, the lines of a net, double exposure. As the smiling face of the woman appears at Fritz's shoulder, laughing recklessly again, forgetting his fear of the moment before, Fritz whirls around, seizes the woman. He goes to her. He resists, but not for very long. He begins to drink, and then he can't resist her at all. Time goes by. She changes the hands of the clock so that it seems to be an hour and a half earlier than it actually is. Charles wakes up. He looks out the window. He sees the city clock, and he realizes that his performance is about to begin, he rushes off to the circus. This photo from the art department shows a poster for the four devils and their leap of death. That's what his leap will be tonight, the leap of death. Charles arrives at the last minute. This is the dressing room, decorated. A farewell to the four devils for their last performance. This is the only picture we have that shows Morneau directing Four Devils. 
He's the man on the right with the megaphone. Standing next to him at the camera is Ernest Palmer, the cinematographer. And it looks like there are probably two cameras there. The two cameras were shooting this movie at the same time, which would give two original camera negatives. From Warnow's treatment for Four Devils. Now follows the mad drama of the air to be worked out to the least detail. Fritz's recklessness is the recklessness of a drunken man before whom the amphitheater, the apparatus, the mighty building with its thousands of occupants, faces, heads, lights, turn and twist in wild distortion. The faces emerge and fade away. Now, the death spring. A thousand eyes measure the awful height. This time, the arena is not covered by a net. This advertisement from Fox's press book shows the ring of fire. This is referred to over and over again in the advertising and in reviews. The triple somersault would be performed through a ring of fire. This is the only image that we have. This is truly a ghost image. You have to look very carefully to see what it is because the art department took it to document a space. It was a long exposure and something very fast was happening. On the upper left, there's a blur in gray. If you look carefully, you can see that it's a trapeze and it's a somersault that's being performed. If you look on the right, you can see a man also blurred holding a trapeze that he will send to the trapeze artist when the somersault is finished. This is another ghost image. It was taken by the art department to document the circus ring from a particular angle. There are some bystanders who happen to be there when the photograph was taken. If we move in closely, we can see the profile of Alfredo Codona, the trapeze artist. Alfredo Codona was the first trapeze artist to perform the dangerous triple somersault as a regular part of his program, twice a day, matinee and evening, during the American circus season and in appearances around the world. He was the only performer to do this during the 20s. The Leap of Death, or Salto Mortale, as it was called in Italian, was so dangerous that even a fall to the net could result in a broken neck and death. At the end of his somersault, Codona was caught by his brother, Lalo, as we see in this diagram. In Four Devils, the character Charles, Charles Morton, ends his triple somersault by catching a trapeze that Marion, Janet Gaynor, sends to him at the critical moment. A somersault to the bar, as that was called, would have been much more difficult. It may never have been performed with the triple at that time in the circus but it was essential for the dramatic climax of the film when Marion swings forward on the return trapeze instead of sending it to Charles. In the version that Murnau shot first that was previewed in July 1928, Marion is determined that both of them should die rather than letting the vamp ruin them. And so she swings forward herself on the return trapeze. Charles has nothing to catch but her body which cannot hold them for long. This was not circus realism, but rather an emotional and even a metaphorical transformation of the act. Janet Gaynor could not forget that experience. I was hanging on the trapeze, and Charles was to hang with his legs around my legs and his head down. So Murnau went to Alfredo Codona and said, this is what he wanted. Alfredo said, this is impossible, Mr. Morneau, because no woman can hold her weight and a man's weight with her hands. This is impossible. I can't do it. No one can do that. Mr. Morneau said, This is what we're going to do. The climax of the film leads to four different endings. None of them, to our knowledge today, are documented with photographs or drawings, except for one small photograph that was included in this handout for the film called a Herald. It is a ghost image, barely recognizable, 
but something. We can see a crowd inside the circus ring. We can see someone lying on the ground. In Murnau's treatment, Charles arrives at the circus for the final performance at the last minute because the vamp has tricked him about the time. He is confused, drunk, and reckless. After the leap of death, he misses the trapeze that Marion throws him and falls to the ground. Panic breaks out. He must be dead. But the circus manager announces that Charles will live and the show will go on. The film ends there. Charles falls. His own recklessness is to blame, with the help of the lady, and he lives. In the final script, both Charles and Marion die, but not because of an accident. When Marion realizes, with heartbreak, that Charles has returned to the lady again after their rehearsal on the afternoon before their final performance without a net, after his promise to her the night before that he had left her for good and that he had come back finally to Marion and to his circus family, she resolves that death is better than letting him remain with the lady. Marion is called a nemesis several times after this. She becomes Charles's second femme fatale, effectively the lady's double in ruining him. The night they perform without the safety net, instead of throwing Charles the trapeze at the end of his leap of death, Marion swings on the trapeze toward him. Therefore, he has nothing to catch after his somersault but her body. When she can no longer hold on, they both fall. This is the ending that Murnau decided to shoot. This version added a brief epilogue to offset the tragedy. But the couple do not come back to life. Instead, the younger brother and sister decide to start over as a married couple, taking the clown with them. Preview screenings were held in Fresno and in San Jose, California, during the first week of July 1928. Nearly 50 letters written in response to the preview questionnaire have been preserved in the Fox archives. Most of them comment on the tragic ending, its difference from what was usually seen, and many writers made a point of urging that that ending not be changed. In closing, my suggestion would be do not change the finale and have the boy and girl live because that would not be true to life. And I think that motion pictures should picture life as it is, even though it showed pain at times. Of course, numerous people will criticize the ending, but I imagine the majority of people will want the logical ending. Elizabeth G. Roney, San Jose. My general impression. Four Devils is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, motion picture that I have ever seen. I say this because Four Devils is truthful and honest and goes relentlessly to its inevitable conclusion. It does not say, this is all a good joke, and then give us a perverted happy ending, which is the usual waterloo of most motion pictures leaning toward tragedy. I have a plea. For God's sake, don't change the end of the picture. Let Pollyanna fans and Sunshine fans come to you in a body, place a revolver against your chest, and demand that you change it. Tell them to go to hell. Richard Shelley, Campbell, California. But after the previews, a new ending was shot. Instead of the couple falling together and dying, it is Marion who falls. She deliberately lets go of her trapeze out of despair. She is assumed dead but she revives and tells the repentant Charles that she loves him. This is the ending that was used when Four Devils premiered at the Gaiety in New York in October 1928 with a synchronized movie tone score. All the variations on a happy ending to an inherently tragic story undercut its force, at least on paper. But they were nothing compared to the changes imposed on Four Devils when the studio decided to re-release it. By the time it was shot, Murnau had already run into insurmountable problems with Our Daily Bread and had ended his employment at Fox. In the late spring of 1929, the studio in Los Angeles had already been transformed by the opening of Fox's movie Tone City, dedicated to the future of sound cinema. And Murnau's personal sponsor, William Fox, 
was absorbed in monumental takeovers of theater chains. The part talky phenomenon had a disastrous impact on Murnau. Four Devils was shot silent and was subsequently partly reshot with dialogue and released as a talkie. Four Devils even had two separate premieres and reviews in the trade journals eight months apart. The non-dialogue version opened in New York on October 3, 1928, and the part-talking version premiered in Los Angeles on June 10, 1929. The dialogue section was substantial, and Murnau had nothing to do with it. Some new credits had been added, Staged by A. H. Van Buren and A. F. Erickson. Dialogue by John Hunter Booth. Fox's publicity stressed that Van Buren and Booth had years of experience working on the Broadway stage and were well qualified to handle dialogue. Erickson had previously been Murnau's assistant. Another new credit went to cinematographer L. W. O'Connell, who had worked alongside Ernest Palmer on the original production. These were the men responsible for creating the new ending before the film went into general release. Nonetheless, that version was also reviewed as Mornau's. Although we cannot know the full effect of these substitutions of key personnel and language in the absence of the films, transcripts in the Fox story files titled Dialogue as Taken from the Screen for Four Devils show us how the style and abundance of talking worked against the mood, rhythm, and characterizations that had been established up until the point when the actors began to speak. Moreover, far more radical changes were made than substituting talking for titles. The narrative events were altered, for the worse, and not simply by substituting a happier ending for Four Devils. Doubtless Mornow never saw it. He had set sail for Tahiti and his new filmmaking venture on May 12. His secretary, Rose Kieran, wrote to him the day after she attended the gala Los Angeles premiere of the new version on June 10. It's quite changed from your story, and Mary startles everyone when she suddenly speaks after almost an entire evening of silence. What was quite changed from Murnau's silent four devils? Adding dialogue and replacing the director, writer, and chief cinematographer were bound to make a difference but that was not all. In this version, Marion succeeds in speaking to Charles after she follows him to the vamp's home, and in his presence, she is treated disparagingly and leaves defeated. Charles reacts by breaking with the vamp definitively. But in order to maintain the story structure, whereby Charles doesn't arrive at the circus until his act is supposed to begin, rather than succumbing to champagne and sex, He is hit by a car and knocked unconscious. He wakes up in a hospital, just in time to run to the circus for his performance. The rest seems to correspond to the first version. Marion falls, but she lives and tells Charles she loves him. The quality of the dialogue, however, is banal and overly explicit. The selling point was, Janet Gaynor talks. Perhaps eliminating the final seduction scene, and thereby reducing Mary Duncan's screen time, was a response to critics who had complained that she played the vamp in an outmoded, exaggerated manner. Or perhaps newcomer Duncan had stolen the show, as Variety's reviewer of the silent version believed. All you see or think of in the picture is Mary Duncan. Janet Gaynor has nothing and does nothing to stand out here. She and the others are completely submerged by Miss Duncan. Murnau earned high praise, even though Four Devils was characterized by this reviewer as another film, like Sunrise, that probably would not earn the profits expected of such an expensive production. It came close, though, to being box office for the American market, and the set's photography and direction were superior. The reviewer ended with these promising words. It looks as though there is a big picture in Murnau. Maybe it will be his next and if one, then more, for he classes among the big directors. Was Murnau, perfectionist that he was, capable of overlooking the fact that a second ending was going to be shot for Four Devils without him, that would still carry his name as director? Or had he refused to participate in it? If dialogue would have been a major component of the film under Murnau's direction, 
Then, in these days of the part talkie at Fox, he would have had to work with a specialized dialogue writer and an intermediary director who would stage scenes from the perspective of sound recording. Was this part of his decision to leave Fox? Mornow gave us two more magnificent films. City Girl, even if it was not completely finalized before he left Fox, and Taboo. What about Four Devils, a ghost film? For now, we have the traces it left behind. <laughs>